Section 8.5 deals with acid catalyzed hydration. It says here that the components of water, so water we can think of as being H and OH, are added across the pi bond. So we're going to add water to our molecule. And the acid catalyzed hydration follows Markovnikov regioselectivity in that the rich get richer. So if I examine the two carbons, in this alkene here, I can see that this carbon has one hydrogen attached to it, whereas this carbon has no hydrogens attached to it. So when I add my water across the double bond, the extra hydrogen from the water is going to go onto this carbon, and then the hydroxyl will go on the second carbon. So it says here that this is a catalyzed reaction, and sulfuric acid is typically used as our catalyst. So you can write the reaction out like this, where you put the alkene plus water, and then we put the sulfuric acid in these square brackets. And that means, when we see those square brackets, that means it's cata catalytic. So this is a catalytic amount of sulfuric acid. So that means that it's not consumed throughout the reaction. It's just a catalyst. But more often than not, we're going to just use H3O plus instead of writing plus H2O and sulfuric acid. And if you think about why that is, well, if I take sulfuric acid and I put it in H2O, the equilibrium is going to lie hard to the side of hydronium, hydronium and the hydrogen sulfate anion. And the reason for that is that the pKa of water is equal to minus 1, oops, minus 1 1.7, and the pKa of sulfuric acid is equal to minus 9. So since hydronium is the weaker acid, based off of the leveling effect, we're mostly going to have hydronium in uh, the reaction mixture. So that's why we draw hydronium for all of these reaction mechanisms, but it is acceptable to write sulfuric acid as a catalyst and, and show that, it's put, that the reaction is performed in water. Let's take a look at this slide. It says the hydroxyl is added to the more substituted carbon. So again, this is Markovnikov. This is Markovnikov addition. The more substituted carbon of the alkene. It says here the more substituted the carbon atom is, the faster the reaction is. If I look at ethylene, ethylene has no substitution, and you can see it, they give it a relative rate of one. But then if I have mono substituted, so if I have a mono substituted alkene, the relative rate goes up 10 to the power of 6. And then if it's di substituted, it goes up even more. And the take home message from these rates increasing. So the rate increases with substitution, and what that tells you is that this data is consistent with a mechanism that must proceed through a carbocation intermediate. So let's examine what that mechanism looks like. So here's the acid catalyzed hydration mechanism, and the good news is it's basically the same as the hydrohalogenation. So that was when we added things like HCl or HBr or HI. So if you understood that mechanism, and if you could draw those mechanisms, this mechanism isn't that much of a stretch. But instead of using sulfuric acid and water, I said that we would use hydronium as the acid. So that's what's drawn here, the Lewis structure. And it shows that our alkene is behaving as a base. It's taking the proton from um, hydronium. We produce a carbocation. But notice that this proton went on the carbon that already had a hydrogen on it. So again, the rich get richer. I form the more stable carbocation. And then water comes in and functions as a nucleophile. And if you're wondering, well, wouldn't that produce a charged intermediate? The answer is yes, you're right. So if we take a look here, so what you produce after that nucleophilic attack, we call this an oxonium ion. So because of that, um, it has to be deprotonated by water. So water comes in, functions as a base, and deprotonates that oxonium to give us the alcohol. So there we go. So that's the mechanism for acid catalyzed hydration. Take a look at, at an example that says draw a mechanism for the following transformation. So I have this alkene, and I'm going to take that and treat that with hydronium, and I'm going to end up with this um, tertiary alcohol. So first thing I should do is draw out the Lewis structure of hydronium to start my curved arrows because my alkene is going to function as a base. Now when I draw the curved arrow from the pi bond to the, to the hydrogen, of um, the hydronium, I like to draw the curve arrow through the carbon where the hydrogen is going to be attached. So let's put our arrows and let's draw what that carbocation would look like. Again, the hydrogen is going here, so the carbocation is going to be here. That's a secondary carbocation. But if you look at the molecule carefully, you can see that there is a proton right here. And that proton could do a hydride shift, 
to produce an even more stable carbocation. So let's draw out what that carbocation looks like. So I go from a secondary carbocation to a tertiary carbocation. So that's the most stable carbocation. Now my water, which was liberated in the first step, can come in and function as a nucleophile. So I'm going to write the whole Lewis structure of water out here. And I'll draw my nucleophilic attack. And then I'm going to produce my oxonium. So let's draw that intermediate. So I have my methyl group. Now I have my water. But again, when oxygen has three bonds and a lone pair, it's got a positive charge. So what's the last step in order to get to my final product is that water is going to come in and function as a base. And it's going to remove one of those protons to produce the alcohol. But if you're wondering what else is happening here is that in this step, not only am I deprotonating the oxonium, but what am I regenerating here is that I'm regenerating H3O plus. So that starts uh, the whole process over again. So you regenerate the catalyst. So remember, this is a catalytic mechanism. So that if you start with hydronium, you should end with hydronium. Let's take a look at section 8.5, which deals with the thermodynamics of hydration. So it says here that the reactants and products of hydration are in equilibrium. We can exploit Le Chatelier's principle to control that equilibrium. So if I take my alkene and water and I treat it with dilute sulfuric acid, which means it's a lot of water and a little bit of sulfuric acid, I'm going to produce my alcohol. Conversely, if I treat that with concentrated sulfuric acid, which is mostly sulfuric acid, and only a little bit of water, I'm going to regenerate the alkene, which we saw um, earlier is produced via an E1 mechanism. So it says here, if we are synthesizing an alcohol from an alkene, we would use excess water. If we are synthesizing an alkene from an alcohol, so doing the, the opposite, we would only use acid and we would not add water to the reaction. And if you think about this from the point of view of Le Chatelier's principle, if I want to go from the alcohol to the alkene, how would I do that? Well, Le Chatelier's principle says that if I remove the water, so if I have less water, I'm going to have, I'm going to have a lower concentration of water over here. Le Chatelier's principle states that a system at equilibrium will, will adjust in order to minimize any stress placed on the system. So by removing or decreasing the amount of water, it's going to drive the reaction in this direction and give us the alkene. The take-home message from this slide is that you have to know that when you take an alkene and treat it with dilute sulfuric acid, you get the alcohol. And when you treat an alcohol with concentrated sulfuric acid, you produce an alkene. This slide deals with the stereochemistry of hydration. And it says here the stereochemistry of hydration is analogous to that of, this should say, hydrohalogenation, okay, um, for the exact same reasons. So it says here, if a new chirality center is formed, we get a mixture of RNS. So something that might be fun to do is try to draw the mechanism for this reaction and show how you end up producing this tertiary carbocation. So I'm giving you a little bit of help here, but what's important is that this tertiary carbocation, it, the carbon is sp2 hybridized, therefore it's trigonal planar, and that means that water can attack from either face of the molecule and that we end up with a mixture of RNS. So as always, if enantiomers are formed in the reaction, then a racemic mixture is obtained.